Recording in progress. All right. Well, welcome everybody who is dialing in right now. We're going to get started. And uh, this really is a topic that is near and dear to our hearts because it's a huge part of what we do really as certified financial planners. Uh, retirement income planning is a pretty broad topic. And as we dig into the content today, I think you're going to see why, right? There's a lot of areas that we're going to fly over. And really, this is legitimately a presentation that we could do a day-long workshop on this stuff and probably still not get through every topic and every nuance of how this works. And we're going to fly through all of it in 45 minutes. In fact, uh, we're going to be wrapping up at the top of the hour just so we can make sure that you're getting on to whatever you need to do. We know a lot of you are dialing in over your lunch hours or uh, you know something else that you're doing for fun, right? Hopefully out there golfing or skiing or whatever you're doing this time of year. So we want to be respectful of your time and, and make sure that we're concise with that. So glad you're here. Thanks for joining us. I am Josh Nelson, Certified Financial Planner, the founder and CEO of Keystone Financial Services. And I am Jeremy Bush, uh, Certified Financial Planner as well. Uh, happy to help you guys out and glad that we can have a a chance to go through some of this educational material. So as always, as we cover this stuff, uh, if, if there's anything you do have questions that you don't get to answer, or if you're watching this after the fact, uh, we'll have our information up at the end. So please feel free to just shoot us an email and uh, we'll be happy to uh, have a conversation with you. Yep, absolutely. That's kind of one of the core things that we we do. I think both of us have the heart of a teacher um, with regard mm -hmm. to not just telling people what to do, right, but educating people. So we're kind of like financial educators in some ways, right? So you can make informed decisions. It's not ever a certified financial planner's job to make your decisions for you, but to give you clarity, right, to give you optics so you can really make a good informed decision. So we are going to cover a lot of questions today, uh, but there's three basic ones. One of those is, what does retirement mean to you? When do you plan to retire? And then finally, how long will your retirement last? These are all relevant things that you need to be thinking about and uh, really kind of have those on the top of your mind, right, as we're going through all these topic areas, because these will make a huge difference based off of all the areas that we cover today. So definitely think about that. We're going to talk about early retirement considerations, first of all. Uh, one thing to think about is that, that if you retire early, that you're going to have fewer accumulation years. So that's one thing that makes a big difference is it's less time to save, but it's also a longer distribution period. You're going to have a longer amount of time that you're going to need to take money out of your retirement funds. So when you think about a long retirement, uh, of course, you say, well, how long am I going to live? We don't know, right? I think the average age of an American, at least, is still up in the upper 70s or so, but uh, very much dependent on genes, very much dependent on lifestyle. Uh, so we're planning on our clients living a lot longer than that, simply because that is the number one fear of retirees, is that they're going to run out of money sometime in retirement. So uh, we hope you live a long, long time, but that's an important thing to be thinking about is early retirement could actually be a lot of extra years that you're going to need to have a big money machine built up to be able to generate that income. So finally, impact on Social Security. We'll dig into that in a bit as far as how Social Security works and how you should plan for that. But Social Security is something that you're paying into over a number of years. And of course, if you're not working, that means less years that you'll be paying into the program. Healthcare and Medicare. Uh, healthcare and Medicare are big topics. We get that a lot as far as clients that are trying to plan for that, especially if you retire before age 65. That really gets complicated because it's very expensive. It's not impossible to get health insurance. Uh, that's very available to be able to get, but that doesn't mean it's cheap. It can be very, very expensive and difficult to plan for. Uh, also, it could be impacting your pension benefits. If you work for a company or the government, local, federal government, you probably have some type of a pension. These days, less and less private companies are offering pensions, more have opted for 401k type plans. But if you have a pension, chances are retiring early actually can make a big difference as far as how their formula works and what kind of income you'll be receiving off of that pension. Yeah, I think that the places that we see that most often, honestly, nowadays are mm -hmm. people who are in education field or mm -hmm. healthcare. You work for some kind of nonprofit organization. Yeah. They're the ones that have those pensions still that can directly impact your Social Security and or Medicare. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and government, the federal government employee, uh, of course, you would have that. Or if you're a railroad employee, uh, there's lots of different nuances, of course. And so it, it's important to know that everything we talk about today is going to be very situational. It's going to depend on really who you work for, when did you work for them, how many years, all that stuff is very, very relevant. 
So on the flip side of things, delayed retirement considerations, uh, you could actually have more accumulation years. And of course, you could say that forever, right? Uh, and never retire. If you're Warren Buffett, you're 92 years old, you're still working. Uh, and he says he tap dances to work every day. He still loves what he's doing. So if that's you and you're still working, good for you. But that is one benefit, though, of, of working longer. Not saying you should work till 92, but one benefit of working longer is it is more time to accumulate the needed retirement funds to be able to generate income. Also, a shorter distribution period, of course, by uh, definition, if you're working longer, then you'd have less years to plan for. That can make a big difference. Impact on Social Security, again, flip side of the coin, uh, there could be uh, more years or higher income that you'd be receiving that would be generating uh, more benefits, right, in Social Security. Impact on health care. Big, big part of that, as we'll talk about later, is that there's a magic age with Medicare of age 65. That's the age that you're first eligible for Medicare in most situations. So for a lot of people, that's a game changer. When they mm -hmm. turn 65, it gets far less expensive for most folks after they hit 65 to be able to generate the, uh, uh, or to be able to, to cover the expenses for their medical. Yeah, lots of factors involved. Of course, the biggest one is, I think, time, right? So oh, the time factor, whether you're going earlier, whether you're going later, um, that that's that's the biggest part I think about planning for retirement. And then I think the funny thing that we always get is, you know, we try to push this out as far as possible in planning yeah. meetings. So we'll put people out to 100, 105. Right. And I think what's the first thing we hear from them, right? Yes, yeah, so I don't want to live that long. Absolutely. <laughs> like you, I people, not people are yeah, very long. very uh, <laughs> sharp about that comment too. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. But the, our goal is really to make sure that we're planning for as long as possible. Uh, that way, you know. Should anything happen in between, we know that you're covered. Yep. We have uh, clients that, uh, of course, there are people that pass away earlier on in retirement, but there are also clients that we have that are way into their 90s at this point, okay. and several of which are very sharp mentally, um, don't walk with assistance. They still have driver's licenses, uh, right? Things like that. Yep. So you say, whoa, that's that's kind of scary. Maybe, right? But it, you know, if you are able to take care of yourself and uh, you haven't had major health events, you might be one of those folks that's way into your 80s, 90s, or even 100s that still is very functional and still wanting to do stuff. You might even be traveling at those ages. Absolutely. So working during retirement, of course, uh, that happens a lot. And we've seen that probably more so this year mm -hmm. because a lot of people are kind of wondering, hey, if, if we're going to, into a recession or we might be going into a recession, maybe I'd like more of a phased approach into retirement as opposed to just boom, picking a day. Uh, so we have had several clients that have been able to arrange that with their employers where they're able to kind of scale back. Instead of working five days a week, they work four days a week. Uh, maybe not as many hours. Maybe they're taking more vacation time course, if you're self-employed, you may be able to kind of choose the gigs that you want, right? Uh, you may not be taking as much work if you're doing it on a contract basis. So that's a big factor. Potential access to healthcare, of course, uh, that could continue. If you're working for an employer, they may be uh, continuing to offer you benefits, even though you're phasing out. I think we see that one mm -hmm. quite often. Yeah, just, absolutely. just because yeah. if you look at the... Yeah the cost of uh, healthcare, just in the open market, mm -hmm. you know, working a little bit longer just until you maybe hit that 65 for yeah. Medicare. Yeah. It, it does make a lot of sense. Yeah, a lot of people do that. A lot of people continue working just enough, uh, maybe yeah. not a full-time schedule, but they work just enough that they're still eligible for those benefits. So that's a big mm -hmm. factor. And then effect on social security, of course, again, that's uh, beneficial because you're still paying into the program. And then non-financial benefits, there's a lot of stuff that could come in there, um, right, that, um, you, you know, your social interactions, things like that. I, I think for me, it would be, uh, I'd figure it out. I think we'd all figure it out if we won the billion dollar lottery, right, of, of what we would do with our time. But, uh, you know, you still, you have to figure out, well, no matter how much money you've got, what are you, you going to do? Yeah, what's your purpose? What do you do when you get up in the morning? So for a lot of people, there are a lot of non-financial benefits uh, people have that sense of purpose, purpose and their social connection. Uh, so that's one factor to think about. So again, phased retirement programs are, are more and more common, uh, especially with such a low unemployment rate right now. And we're hearing increased layoffs in you know, certain companies. But by and large, when we talk to business owners, the challenge right now is that they can't find qualified people. So uh, employers we found are actually more and more flexible as far as allowing people to kind of phase out as opposed to you know, potential losing that person right all together by not allowing that flexibility as they kind of move into retirement. Yeah. And it does give people, you know, some fun, uh, fun opportunities as well. Mm -hmm. You say, well, yeah. I don't want to do this full-time gig that I've been doing for the past 30 years, but I'm 
you know, I don't want to go home and sit on the couch and be bored. Right. So yeah, my dad did that for a lot of years. This, Absolutely. That, right? <laughs> right. So they get to go do a part-time job doing something fun. Yeah. yeah. And they've got that expert. You know, the thing is, is uh, sometimes we hear that comment from people and I'm sure sometimes it's true is that, well, nobody wants to hire an old person. Uh, not necessarily. There's a lot of employers that uh, you, a lot of experience, right. Uh, that you can share and to be able to contribute, especially in a mentoring capacity. Uh, we find that as people get into their later years, we're not quite there yet. Right. But in, in their later years that they start to shift right where they're really kind of passing on information and sharing as opposed to maybe doing all the work themselves so that brings us to how long will retirement last and of course if, if we knew that for sure that would make it, the math a lot easier right on all mm -hmm. this stuff but we are living longer um, certainly the the uh, the life expectancies are going up 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 I, I think late 70s is on average what they're saying that the average American uh, will live to uh, surprisingly over the last couple of years because of uh, COVID and some other factors. Number actually dropped a little bit, but still kind of looking at late 70s. Uh, to me, though, you think about late 70s, there's a lot of people that are going to live beyond that. If that's the average, there's a lot of people that are going to live well into their 80s, 90s, and 100s. And of course, as a trend, those numbers are going up, especially we're kind of on the verge, hopefully, right, of some breakthroughs on things like Alzheimer's, yeah. Parkinson's, some of these things that really can deteriorate people's quality of life later on. So that's a big factor. Um, the other thing that, to think about is that the average retirement may very well last 25 years, especially if you're thinking early retirement. Uh, early retirement, of course, that's kind of subjective, but usually it means before 65, that, that would be kind of the average age for people because of Medicare. We oftentimes see that as a trigger of when people retire. Yeah. And, uh, and again, our, you know, our, uh, position on this is let's plan for the best, you know, let's plan for the long term mm -hmm. and, you know, should something happen before then and mm -hmm. whatnot, at least, you know, you're taken care of. Yeah. But knowing that they've done a number of studies on that too, again, number one fear of retirees is that they're going to run out of money sometime in retirement. Um, so you don't want to be the person who's 89 years old and then surprisingly, wow, I'm still in pretty good health and I can still get around and do stuff. Yeah. You don't want to be that person and be out of money, especially because uh, that, that flexibility later on is important to be able to cover maybe for some flexibility around health care and so forth. Absolutely. We'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, retirement income uh, planning. A big thing is, is to think about your goals. And I think everybody has different ideas as far as what they want their retirement to look like. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's important to be thinking about a few things. So one of those is that uh, really to be able to enhance your ability to enjoy retirement. Uh, Social Security was put into place back in the 1930s because we were trying to keep people from starving to death back in the Great Depression. So Social Security was never meant to have an awesome retirement, right? Where people are traveling around the world and golfing every day or whatever you want to do, right? Uh, that's completely up to you, right? As far as what do you do with your time, but it certainly does allow for more flexibility. So it also manages the risk of outliving your income. We talked about that. That's a big factor. And, uh, you know, sometimes people aren't worried about that, but I'd say the average person is. That's why we always review people's financial statements with them, even in retirement, to be able to give them the confidence that, hey, we've worked the numbers. Mm -hmm. We're taking an appropriate amount out of your investment accounts right now, uh, because that's really where that comes into play, right? Is if people are kind of invading their retirement accounts or investments too much too early, then they really start to increase the risk of outliving their money. And then, uh, of course, there's all kinds of unexpected things. That's just life, right? As the stuff happens. And so we, it's, we need to be able to try to at least anticipate that and leave some wiggle room in the plan to make sure that there, there aren't uh, just bare bones assumptions being used for these things. And I think our clients can probably speak to that too, mm -hmm. is how much we yeah. try to poke as many holes into your financial plan as possible with, mm -hmm. with unexpected things, no matter what that might be. Right. Uh, just to kind of make sure that you have 100% confidence in what we're doing. Yep, absolutely. We we talk about that a lot as far as living expenses with people and and you know trying to challenge people a little bit, right? As far as mm -hmm. what kind of expenses are built in there, because right. if you have a house, a car, a dog, um, any of these things, right? Kids, grandkids, you're going to have unexpected expenses. There's just going to be stuff that happens absolutely. that you couldn't possibly have anticipated. So we want to make sure that that uh, that wiggle room is built into the process. So let's talk about process now. Well, we kind of put this into a pie chart. So there's a few things that you really need to think about. And again, this is a framework. We're, we're not trying to become experts today, but really trying to introduce some topics that really you, you should be thinking about, right, if you haven't already. And a big part of that, again, is how much income you'll need. Um, everybody has a different idea on this as far as what they re what the retirement will look like. Yeah. Some people probably really can live just on Social Security because they're um, what they do is just 
not that expensive, right? I mean, it could just be that they have a very low budget need and, and so they don't have a whole lot of need for their spending. Yeah, some people are more active than others. Mm -hmm. uh, some people are perfectly happy doing, you know, mm -hmm. just hanging out. Other people like to be on the go. So mm -hmm. all these things you got to take into account is, you know, what does my retirement look like and how much do I need to to, to do to spend that? Yeah, and this is one that you'll probably have to wrestle with uh, because most people say, if, if it's a new client coming in and starting to visit mm -hmm. with us about this stuff, most people have no idea. So if you are thinking, I have no idea how much income I'll need, you've got plenty of company. There are a lot of people that have that exact same thought. And oftentimes it really does take a, a process really of kind of thinking through. And, uh, you know, we, we end up helping with that, right? We help people brainstorm and think about what types of expenses they have now. Some of those things may go away, right? It could be that you hit Medicare age or things like that. You might have some of your expenses drop off. We find that a lot of times people have increased expenses, right? Mm -hmm. Because if, if you're not retired, if you are retired, say if you're not working anymore, you've got time. You didn't have time before and now yep. you may want to do some stuff, right? I know I would. Absolutely. Yeah, more travel. Mm -hmm. uh, the other next one is, you know, considering the major factors, like mm -hmm. I think everybody can probably take it into account right now as we're as we're recording this inflation. Yep. Right. That's so a big thing. Uh, it had just had another inflation. Yeah, probably the, the word of the year, today. right? <laughs> the word of the year. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, we always try to, you know, factor that in. How is that going in? Uh, but other other factors as well, you know, things that we throw on there. Um, how often do you need a new car? Mm -hmm. Right? Or uh, major, major travel? What are you going to do with the kids, uh, grandkids, etc. So lots of different factors to consider on that. Yep, absolutely. Uh, but, and for those of you who are wondering, you know, how do we take that into account, knowing that inflation is much higher right now than it normally is? We've got ways to kind of use long-term projections. Uh, sometimes we can even uh, stress test things and say, well, we think inflation is going to be really high for the next couple of years, and then it'll drop back down. There's all kinds of things that we can do to make you comfortable with the numbers as we're kind of looking at your retirement story, right, of uh, what we're trying to design for you. Absolutely. So taking uh, total income from Social Security, pensions, of course, other income sources, it could even be part-time work, things like that. So we do need to take that into account. Identify the gap, of course, and sometimes there is and sometimes there isn't. We might find that we really drill down and we, we like math, right? We're, we're certified financial planners, so we, 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 like, we like math. <laughs> so we like to dig into this stuff and help you identify, is there a gap? Sometimes there is, sometimes there isn't, but um, it's not just identifying the gap, but okay, so what do we do about that? And of, of course, uh, we let the math speak for itself. Uh, there, there are different things. You always have options, right? You've always got a few options on what you can do really to bridge that gap. And it may be that you've got to change your plans a little bit. It may be that, um, or that you choose anyway, to work mm -hmm. a little bit longer, or maybe do a phased retirement as to as opposed to starting uh, or just to stopping all one time. Absolutely. And that gap is, you know, it's bigger for some people than it is for others. Mm -hmm. uh, but really, at that point, it kind of comes down to distribution percentage as mm -hmm. well, right, yeah. which we'll cover later on in this. But that distribution percentage is a, a, a pretty big deal. That's a big deal. And then using savings to bridge the gap, of course, uh, is that you may have some other buckets of money. Maybe you've got some cash. Maybe you're getting a severance payment or an early retirement package. Uh, mm -hmm. That happens a lot. So it may be that you've got some other money that's going to be bridging the gap for a while uh, from some of these other income sources. So how much annual income will you need? And that uh, we we don't know without talking to you, of course, <laughs> and, and drilling down and really getting into your situation. We don't like rules of thumb. A good rule of thumb that we hate is, and this is what you'll see, if you go into financial websites mm -hmm. and all kinds of stuff, they're going to say, oh, well, you're not going to need 100% of your, uh, your spending from before retirement. You only need 60 to 90%. That's not our experience. With, with most clients, they're going to need something different than that. Yeah, I've heard this in our industry since I started financial mm -hmm. advising, yeah. and it's one that I, I, you know, personal experience, I just don't agree with. Um, you very rarely spend less in retirement than you are currently. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and a lot of it is that time factor. You, yep. know, you used to spend a lot of time at work. Now, all of a sudden, you don't have that time at work. What mm -hmm. are you going to do to fill your time? you will find things to fill your time. If you talk to most retirees, they're probably more busy in retirement than they were while they were working. Yeah. Right. Doing a lot of fun stuff. Yeah. I think where some of these statistics come from too, unfortunately, is that I think there's a lot of situations where people can't spend more. 
And so they, yeah. they have to cut back, in other words, uh, because they, they're just not able to generate the same amount of income off of their, their other stuff as when they were working. So mm-hmm. uh, some of it's forced. But of course, the whole point here of doing planning is that we want abundance. We, we really want you to be able to continue doing what you've been doing if you want to, and probably more if you like to travel before. Now, you've got a lot of time. You probably want to travel even more and maybe even doing some yeah. international travel. Uh, maybe you, you do it in, in luxury and you're doing first class tickets, things like that. It, it could be that, you, you know, you're really doing it in a very different way than you did before. So especially in those early years, too. Yeah. Uh, but we've noticed that there's a lot of people that kind of have some bucket list items. There's kind of some pent up. All right. We've always wanted to do this and this and this. And, you know, we're young enough and healthy enough. Oh, yeah. We want to go out and do stuff now. So we want to make sure that you can do that. Um, so beware those statistics and and just be aware that our experience at least is that if people can do what they were doing before, they want to, and they'll probably even do more of it. So, yeah. which could mean that your budget actually goes up for a while. Yeah. And then, you know, and some people will be sitting in meetings and let's say, well, what about those expenses that are changing? Mm-hmm. You know, my mortgage yeah. isn't going to be around forever Yep. or I've been aggressively paying it down. Well, as, as we found also, yes, there are some things that decrease, they go away, mortgages, car loans, things like that. Especially mm-hmm. we try to help people become debt-free, mm-hmm. you know, before or as, as, as soon as possible. Right. Uh, but there's always some other cost that comes along with that. So healthcare is a major yeah. one that comes along with that. Uh, that one, unfortunately, never really goes away. Um, hopefully, you're all very healthy and very healthy for a long time. Otherwise, that can really become, you know, a big thing. But other things like, uh, you know, different kinds of retirement pursuits, like mm-hmm. you were saying, mm-hmm. travel, hobbies, other things that you might consider as well. Yep. Yep, for sure. So be thinking about all of that, right? This is part art and it's part science, as you can imagine. It's not all math, right? It's also really thinking about you as an individual and what it is that you want to do. So a good place to start is just listing out your expenses. And that's probably uh, nobody's favorite activity, by the way. Uh, Budgeting is is not normally something that people enjoy doing. Now, we, we have a lot of engineers as clients and we have people that enjoy spreadsheets and really get into this. If that's you, that's great. Uh, but for most people, that isn't an activity that they enjoy. So listing out your expenses, getting into specific categories, things like that, that's great. But if you say, uh-uh, realistically, I'm not going to do that, there are other ways you can do that. Pull your bank statements. Where is your spending coming from? In other words, if you're using a debit card, uh, your checking account to cover most of your expenses, pull some statements, uh, right? There's good online portals that will allow you to run reports. You'll know pretty quickly what your actual spending is. Although I wouldn't just use one month, um, certainly take a whole span of time and then average it out. That's a good way to start. If you use credit cards, uh, you can do the same thing. You can use the expenses that come in on your credit cards. And of course, don't uh, don't forget to use things that don't happen every month. Some things are like Netflix. It comes every month, right? But and there's other stuff that might come every quarter, twice a year, your car insurance, things like that. Make sure that that stuff gets factored in or at least averaged out. Yeah. So how do we account for health care costs? So... Uh, obviously, Medicare helps, uh, I would say, the vast majority of people at age 65. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, there are other things to consider in their Medicare prescription coverage, the mm-hmm. uh, Medigap policies. Uh, you know, Medicare does not pay for long-term care. Yeah. Long-term care is always one of those things that comes into, into play. Yeah. Um, you know, how do we how do we even begin to pay for that? Do we need a long-term care policy? Mm-hmm. Uh you know, we get that one, I would say a lot. Yeah. You know, what is it? Uh, How does it work? Uh, Is it, you know, cost effective? I think for the most part, you know, if if you were lucky enough 20, 30 years ago to buy a long term care policy, Mm -hmm. uh, and you still have it, uh, I think our general consensus is don't ever let it go. Yeah, because you probably can't get a new one. Yeah, because they just don't make them like that anymore. Yeah, Yeah. right. Um, but is, you know, the stats don't lie. Uh, long-term care is something that I think most people have to deal with at some point. Yeah. $93,000 a year. That's the national average. And they say nursing home, but rarely do people use the term nursing home anymore. A lot of times it's called assisted living or it's called skilled nursing and things like that. So there's a whole, uh, you know, variety of long-term care costs that could uh, come into play. And of course, we all hope that we don't need it, right? We hope that we just die in our sleep happily, right, someday, and we never needed long-term care. But the the reality is a lot of people do, even if it's for a very short amount of time at the end of their life. So it is something that's worth factoring in, of course, uh, kind of beyond the scope of what we can get into in detail today uh, with our time. But uh, certainly one thing to be thinking about is medical costs as you get older. Absolutely. 
Yep. And then, as we've said before, you know, other things to consider inflation. Inflation is very real right now. Yeah. I think uh, uh, leading up to this, at least for the past 10 years, this has probably been something that's farthest on anybody's mind. You know, we've been yeah. sitting at around a low two, 2.1 percent yeah, very well for the past decade plus. Uh, now, as of today, I think they came back and said 7.7 percent. Right. Which so. The market celebrating, right? Which you know, yeah. before seven point seven, it's so high. But yeah, compared to ten, or whatever numbers they've been using. So hopefully that trend continues, right? Hopefully those numbers come down more to a, an average uh, that we're used to, maybe two, three, four percent. I think we could live with that. Yeah, seven, eight, nine, ten percent. Uh, that's clearly not something that's sustainable. Yeah, and then recognizing yeah. the impact of taxes. Now that's that's something that we can actually kind of help plan for, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Yeah. Is we can there's ways of uh, mitigating the impact of taxes uh, as long as you're willing to plan for it and if we have enough time to do so. Yeah, that's a huge part of our practice. By the way, we spend a lot of conversation. People uh, talk to financial advisors or planners. Oftentimes, they think it's just about investments, but taxes can have just as much, if not more, impact than where your investments are. If you pick this investment versus that investment option, so not to minimize investments, but taxes are a big deal. Yeah, absolutely. And so, yeah, again, going towards inflation, you know, how does inflation work? Really, in the long term, it just makes things more expensive. Mm -hmm. So something yeah. that costs you a dollar today might cost you a dollar fifty in five years. Mm -hmm. We see that all the time. I think if you've been around, um, you know, purchasing anything, purchasing groceries mm -hmm. or purchasing vehicles or purchasing really anything, you've pretty much seen this over your life already. Yeah, absolutely. So illustration here, you can see loss of purchasing power right now. We feel like we're losing lots of purchasing power at seven, eight, nine, ten percent inflation. But it is something that's kind of like the silent thief, though, during normal times, kind of the silent thief that inflation ends up kind of eating away at, uh, at our stuff. We need a rising income. In other words, it's not just a, a fixed income we need in retirement, but a rising income. Uh, we talked about taxes. Again, a big part of, of retirement planning is taxes, because uh, if you've got income, you're going to have taxes off it, almost certainly. So ordinary income tax, uh, for example, interest, uh, it could be also if you're working, it could also be money that's coming out of your IRA that would normally be taxed as ordinary income. There are special tax rates for capital gains and qualifying dividends uh, right now. And of course, the rules can change, yeah. right? That's and to a do. large degree what keeps us employed, right? And CPAs and so forth is the fact that it's not only learning this stuff, right? And learning how things work, but the fact that it's changing constantly. So keeping up with it is a big part of what we do. Moving targets yeah. all the time, absolutely. Yeah. Tax-free income, uh, that you say tax-free income, where does that exist? Um, well, municipal bonds, that's one example of things that could pay a tax-free income. Or if you have VA benefits, oftentimes VA benefits or uh, disability benefits consider can be tax-free. So it's important to be accounting for that because it can pay the bills, but may not actually hurt you from a tax perspective. Yeah. And Special it, rules for tax advantage. Yes, so tax-free yeah. income and tax yeah. advantage. Accounts, Roth IRAs. Like Roth yeah, IRAs. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Lots of tools. There's a lot of things that we can use to your advantage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then what are the risks involved? So obviously, again, perfect year to be discussing this, right? Mm -hmm. Market risk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a yo-yo. It's an adventure, right? Yeah. There's up and down. There's lots of volatility. So market risk is always something that we have to take into account. Reinvestment risk. Um, as dividends get paid in, or as you have more money, what, uh, you know, what's the cost of, or the risk of reinvesting that money? Yeah. Or the interest rates that are being used, right? Yeah, the three-legged stool, we just talked about this yesterday with some we clients did. too. And um, social security is usually a big part of that. Although our younger clients, you know, younger, whatever you define as mm -hmm. younger, the younger you are, the less likely it is that you want to even factor that leg of the stool into the mix. Um, because you keep getting these statements, right? Saying that you're going to not get your full benefits at 2030 or something. So um, legitimate, right? But we do want to at least be factoring in uh, that if you're older, if you're closer, even if you're drawing benefits now, we want to be factoring that in. Of course, employer pensions, which to a large degree don't exist anymore unless you work for the government, the railroad, things like that. Some companies still Some offer companies. it, but that's more and more rare. Uh, union pensions, that's another one. Oftentimes you may get a pension if you're part of a union. Mm -hmm. Then individual savings and investments, more and more over the years, more and more pressure on individual saving and investing. So especially for those of you who have a few years until you're retiring, talked about accumulation before. It's a big factor is, is making sure you're putting in, in an adequate amount. You're not spending it all. In other words, a, a big part of that needs to be saved for the future. Yeah. And, and even within just that individual savings and investments section, 
you know, there are various investment vehicles that we could build another three-legged stool from, right? Depending Absolutely. on the taxability of the types of accounts and and uh, how we kind of fund those, mm -hmm. right? And so we do a lot of that, even, even if we just say, I don't have a pension, I don't want to count on social security, you can still make a three-legged stool mm -hmm. for tax diversity yeah. just through different savings vehicles and investment vehicles. Yep. So the rules, again, will change consistently over time. Uh, probably no changes with social security in the near term because it's a political hot potato. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's one of those things that eventually, mathematically, uh, it will have to change as the years go on. So just keep that in mind. So social security basics, we're going to fly over this because we do a whole seminar just on this. Absolutely. Uh, we've done podcasts, all kinds of things, and it's an important topic. But a couple of different things. Uh, number one, benefit calculation. The earliest you can draw benefits uh, benefits uh, generally is at age 62. There are some exceptions to that, but 62 is the earliest. Most people wait until normal retirement age, which for uh, all of you basically is between age 66 and age 67. So we can dig into that with you. It's based on your year of birth, but we can dig into that. If you take your benefits earlier, you get a reduction. Mm -hmm. But of course, you start getting money earlier. If you wait until later, you could wait up until age 70 and keep getting more credits than you would get more. So one thing to think about um, for that is really what your timing is as far as when you start drawing benefits. Now, you might be wondering, uh, when do I actually, or how do I calculate the benefit that's probably beyond the scope of what we're going to get into in detail today, but it's the 35 highest years. A lot of misconceptions out there as far as, no, it's the last three years, or it's the, the highest three years, or you know, all these things we hear is the, the top 35 years. And uh, so it's number of years worked, not you've earned. It's averaged out into a formula. That's basically how it ends up working. I mean, inflation does get factored in. And for those of you who are drawing benefits, you probably have heard you're getting a big increase, right? And your benefit for next year because of, start January. of inflation. So uh, uh, that's something people haven't seen for a long time. Most of the time, it's just a paltry increase this year because of high inflation, it is factored in. So it's it's not just a fixed income. Uh, there, there is a way that you can get more money over time uh, just by inflation kind of kicking in. Yeah. So bottom line that we talked about this before, social security is there as maybe a leg, maybe it's not a big leg, but it is a leg keeping people from starving to death, kind of covering, covering very basic needs. It's probably not going to have you living large in retirement. So yeah, not, not of, to minimize it, but it's it's one thing just to factor that uh, it, it, we don't want to count too much on it. Yeah, a lot of factors go into when it makes sense. And it's very individual, mm -hmm. right? Who, yeah. who takes social security when and why? Um, and so that's kind of a very personal thing that we go through with, I think, for everybody. But I think for the vast majority of people that we do talk to, mm -hmm. uh, Social Security is a part uh, yeah. that does not cover the majority of what you need. Yep, absolutely. Let's talk about pensions a little bit. We're not going to spend a lot of time here because most people don't have them, frankly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but if you do, if that's great. Just know it's very individual. When it comes to a payout option, there are different options. Single life annuity means that you would have a guaranteed income for life, but just your life. In other words, you get mm -hmm. hit by the proverbial bus, income goes away. Or a QJSA, which is a qualified joint, joint survivor, survivor <laughs> annuity. So. Right, that's a mouthful, but it's, it means that you and somebody else's life, probably your spouse, right? Absolutely. Um, both of your lives. Uh, but, or you can get a lump sum. Increasingly, plans are offering a lump sum option for people who say, you know what, just give me the money. Um, there, mm -hmm. there normally is a calculation that would allow you to do that and normally roll it over right into a yep. qualified Throw retirement an IRA and Off you go. Yep. Usually no inflation adjustments. Government annuities do. Uh, but a lot of times there's a cost of living adjustment. If it's with a private employer, those single annuities, it's usually just that amount. You'll never get an increase. Yeah. And really what it comes down to is every plan is different, right? So you got to read through the explanation of the benefits. You got to see what makes sense. Uh, and really it comes down to, well, how much income do I need in retirement? Right. Is this better going to serve me as a lump sum where I have more flexibility mm -hmm. or am I good with just having $2,000 a month from this plan for the rest of my life? Right. Yeah. And it's very individualized as always. All these slides, by the way, we're talking in generalizations. It's very much dependent on your situation, your family situation, your work history, your tax situation, all those things. So uh, just keep that in mind is that uh, you want to be very careful to know that all these rules are based off of your individual situation. So identifying the gap, really trying to figure out, all right, well, what, what do we need, right? As far as the personal savings, how much needs to come out of my own investments? We uh, talk about creating a money machine when it comes to saving for retirement is getting to a critical mass where you've saved enough money in various things, whether it be retirement funds or investments, 
rental properties, whatever that you've been doing to build your wealth over time, the whole point is to get to a critical mass that will generate income for the rest of your life, or maybe no, no guarantee, obviously, but high probability, at least, that would generate income for the rest of your life. So knowing that the personal saving side of this uh, has a, a huge part of it. And I think increasingly for younger and younger people that don't have pensions or maybe they're assuming social security is not going to be there. It's very important to have an investment strategy that is indivi individualized to you. Uh, there's no cookie cutter approach. Uh, cookie cutter approaches are not good in our opinion. Uh, oftentimes that's how employer plans are set up is they do give you kind of a default option just because they know that a lot of people aren't going to look into the details and invest their money. Uh, based mm -hmm. off of any uh, strategy. In other words, they kind of give you a default cookie cutter option uh, that may or may not be good for you. So it's important that you have a strategy that's really designed for your own family situation and your comfort level. Yeah, of course, many... especially this year, right? Uh, we kind of recognize that the market doesn't just go up, right? Yeah. How many people have sat there and looked at your first 401k and said, I have no idea what all these mean. Right. I think I'm just going to pick that one yeah. or, you know, maybe a handful of them, uh, you know, but knowing what your risk tolerance is, knowing what your goals for this money are and how, how long you have to save it up and do something with it mm -hmm. all kind of plays in, which is why we kind of, we do look at a lot of retirement plans, 401ks, 457s, mm -hmm. et cetera, and try to help people specifically pick those investment yeah, products that absolutely. suit their needs. Yeah, And that's different for everybody. Yeah. Make the most of your employer plan, especially if they're giving you matching contributions, that's pretty typical. You want to make sure that you're not leaving money on the table with any of this stuff, right? Whether, whether it be social security, Medicare, all the rules that come into these things, you want to make sure that you're really making the most of it. And that's to a large degree, what we're doing really is we're optimizing people's financial situations with the resources that they've got. Now, withdrawal rate, we, we like to talk about withdrawal rate, mm -hmm. that, that's pretty important. Um, and, you know, really our opinion is that we need to be careful about how much is coming out of, of accounts per year. We'll, we'll talk about this more in a bit as well, but it's really important to be thinking about how much are we drawing out. So it's kind of like the goose and the golden egg, that old fable. Some of you might remember, um, you know, the uh, the goose kicked out a golden egg every day and the farmer said, that's great, and started getting really wealthy. But then he got greedy yep. and he cut the goose open and killed it. And there were no golden eggs inside. And so now that doesn't work out so well. So silly fable, but that's kind of what happens in a lot of situations is people kind of blow through their retirement savings or investments because they're trying to take too much out of it. So kind of think of it like an ATM. Uh, the, yeah, the bank comes out and fills the ATM every so often. There's only so much cash in that ATM, right? So eventually yep. it's going to empty out and, and then there's no more money left. So it's yep. very, very important to be cognizant of that you know and just like we were talking with that three-legged stool order of withdrawals mm -hmm. um so kind of going if if you everything you own is in one traditional ira mm -hmm. you don't yeah. really have much choice right as to where the money is going to come from uh however if you do have kind of different pots of money that get taxed differently mm -hmm. you do have you know a little bit more tax diversity and what makes sense as to at what time and in what amount do we take from each pot in order to kind of maintain the optimal balance. Yeah, that's right? a good point too. People think of uh, investment diversification, but tax diversification is important too, mm -hmm. um, right? And understanding the tax code, understanding how it works and trying to anticipate the future. So big, big part of what we do. One of those things, of course, is required minimum distributions, which for those of you who aren't anywhere close to 72, probably don't even know what we're talking about. Uh, requ required minimum distributions, basically that's the uh, the, the Internal Revenue Code says that if by the age of 72, that's the current rule, by the age of 72, if you're not already starting to draw money out of your qualified retirement plans like IRAs and 401ks, you have to start taking money out. So basically, they want you to start paying taxes, more or less, right? Absolutely. So that's a, a big, big factor we need to play in. Uh, into your scenario, right? As we're designing it, it's not just what you got now, but what's kind of coming up in the future, trying to anticipate them. Yeah. And then, of course, asset allocation. Uh, so really, uh, you know, how do we transition? And and this one, it gets me kind of, because whenever we do talk to somebody who mm -hmm. is, you know, a year out or six months out from retirement, uh, we always get that question. It's like, so how does this work? Right. right? How do how, I get money? <laughs> I've been paying in for so long. And how does it, how do I get it back? How does right. it start to do that? So taking that into account, you know, timing of it, um, 
what that looks like again withdrawal percentage mm -hmm. right the yeah. rate that you're taking out from it how do we make this last yeah that's a big deal yep and, and thinking about uh, not just what do you need today but what's coming up in the future knowing that when you retire it's not like you need all the money all at once right we need to kind of be thinking about the future where's your future income going to come from and is it do, do we have a plan in other words do we have an asset allocation that's really designed that can help a few things one of those is providing ongoing income um, and really income is the outcome behind all of this stuff really right is. nobody invests in anything just because it's fun i don't think right i mean maybe some stuff right collector cars or things like that oh, yeah. well, most people the reason why they're putting money into their 401k or they're building up their investments is sometime out in the future i want to start getting an income and i'd love to have an income that doesn't require me to work <laughs> right absolutely and some people want to have a money machine that they can just kind of do what they want to do uh, so it needs to provide ongoing income. Uh, we also need to manage asset volatility. Again, you're like this, mm -hmm. good example of a very volatile market, making sure we've got a strategy designed that is one that you can live with, basically, during a, a bad market, one that you can kind of ride through that and not make any crazy decisions, because oftentimes that's where people get hurt financially, uh, is that they end up making the wrong move at the wrong time because they get scared or they get greedy. Those are the two main emotions that cause yeah. people to to do stuff that probably isn't in their best interest, but they do it anyway because their emotions get the better of them. Absolutely. And, yeah. you know, make sure that the likelihood that that will last as long as is needed and be done in a very tax efficient way yeah. over your entire lifetime is very important things to consider. Yep. Yep, absolutely. So that's a, a big, big part of what we do. Um, again, income is the outcome. Big, big part of what we do is really planning around your current income and how do we produce future income. Yep. Yep. And to, you know, if a secondary thing for some people, it would be nice if I could leave money to my kids and to charity or whatever it is. But oh, yeah. for most people, it's you know, number one consideration is how do I produce income? <laughs> yep. So uh, for your personal savings and investments, of course, there's all kinds of things you could be doing with your money. Uh, so it, it'll be even more than this list, right? But you could do bonds, bond funds, dividend paying stocks, um, all kinds of things that you could be doing with your money. So uh, when it comes to uh, asset allocation, there's a lot of different stuff. We'll kind of list them off here. CDs, TIPS, Treasury Inflation Protected Securities, Mutual Funds. Uh, so lots and lots of stuff that could all deserve their own seminar, basically. Yeah, absolutely. We could that. probably pick one of these yeah. off of the, all of these lists and, and just go into depth on it. But all of these really play in. And it's it's typically a mixture, you know, of all these types of things. Uh, some are not appropriate for some people. Yeah. Some are appropriate for others. Um, but really, it's just a matter of how does your risk tolerance fit in and how do these kind of help you maintain that? Yeah. So you're not driving yourself crazy or you know, driving your spouse crazy whenever something crazy in the market happens. Yeah, when you hear, hear we say risk tolerance, that's kind of like our financial mumbo jumbo language, right? What, what it means by that, basically, and you'll see this, right? If you read articles and things like that, more or less, it's it's kind of that sleep at night factor. It really yeah. just kind of comes down to uh, what are we trying to accomplish? And uh, can you live with that investment when it's not doing well, basically? Or mm -hmm. is it going to make you lose sleep at night? Um, you know, and to want to do something crazy, you know, and, and cash out at the wrong time. Well, oftentimes people do that, especially in a market like this, because last year was such a good market, right? It was hard not to yeah. make money, actually. Uh, this year, it's actually hard to make money. And so a lot of people piled on risk, not our clients, of course, but a lot of clients, yeah. you know, a lot of people out there piled on risk and put all their money in tech stocks and things like that that are getting crushed this year. And they just didn't understand how much risk they were taking with their money. So now they're they're um, kind of surprised and not in a good way. And very emotional about it. Yep. Which is a bad thing to be. Yep. Well, touch on annuities. So what's an annuity, Jeremy? So an annuity is basically just a contract. Um, between, there's an insurance company who you sign a contract with saying, I'll give you X amount of dollars for premiums. Uh, in return, you're going to give me a guaranteed income. Mm -hmm later on in life yep so it's kind of like a pension right kind of like a pension, like a pension a private that you pension. pay for a private yeah. pension through the insurance company um it can provide some nice income stream for life uh sometimes it's again one of the legs of those stools mm -hmm. uh depending on if it's right uh there are pros and cons of course to pensions but um you know relatively it's just basically buying a guaranteed income yep yep absolutely and uh it's a tool so you might think, oh, you guys are for annuities. No, we're not saying we're for annuities, but we're also not against annuities. Uh, one thing to, to keep in mind, though, is that when it comes to annuities, um, these are issued by insurance companies. Insurance companies tend to have their, their names on stadiums and tall buildings and things like that. So they're in the business of making money. 
Just yes, know that there is a cost involved and they're probably going to win. <laughs> so uh, that's one thing you do need to make sure that they're not right for everybody. Uh, it, it's a potential solution, but not right for everybody. Withdrawal rates, we talked about that before. Again, thinking about current versus future income needs. Sustainable withdrawal rate, we're going to touch on. That's very important, especially in a market like this. Uh, calculation methods, uh, four to five percent. So that's the rule that we like to use is a four, especially four percent is a good conservative withdrawal rate. Yeah. What we mean by this is that if you had a million dollars or a billion dollars, whatever amount you want to use, so let's, let's say it's a million dollars, $40,000 a year, 50 if you want to push it, but $40,000 a year is how much income can come off of that million dollars per year in that investment portfolio. So our 4% and 5% rule work a little bit different than sometimes when you read articles, things like that. Yeah. So I think I think most articles, when they say that 4%, you can probably find plenty of articles if you Google it that say the 4% rule is not the 4% right. rule. It should yeah. be lower than that. Right. But how we use the 4% rule is, as Josh has said, a million dollars, right? Mm -hmm. So what if all of a sudden uh, we're sitting and market goes down by 25% mm -hmm. and now your million dollars is $750,000? Can I still take that 40%? You can take 4%. You can take 4%. Off of that amount. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Exactly. So now that 4% is still 4%, but instead of 4% of a million, it's 4% of 750,000. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. So the 4% rule does work in that factor mm -hmm. as long as you keep adjusting it with what's happening in the market. Yep. And on the upside, again, when things are great, that million dollars goes up to a million and a half. Now you can take 4% of a million and a half. So the, yeah, you want to be careful about when you read financial articles, which there's 20 gazillion of them, and they sometimes contradict each other. Uh, I think that's, uh, again, why we have jobs, right? Because right. there's too much information out there that uh, it's, it's hard to actually decipher what do I actually do with this. But uh, that 4 to 5% uh, rule that we use anyway, mathematically, uh, you know, it, it kind of makes it hard to run out of money in that situation. Yeah. So again, can't say the word guarantee, but uh, that's our way of being really cautious, yeah. especially during the early years of retirement, because if you've got several decades ahead of you, say if you're a recent retiree, say you're 60 or 65 years old, you kind of need to plan on a few decades worth of income. Mm -hmm. We need to be really careful that we're not drawing down your savings too early. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. And then, of course, we talk about order withdrawal. So we kind of hit on this earlier, mm -hmm. uh, the types of accounts that we're using, you know, a traditional IRA versus a Roth IRA versus a uh, an individual or a joint account, yep. you know, they all get taxed differently. Roth areas, of course, everything's after tax as mm -hmm. it is, which makes yep. them so awesome. Um, but being able to kind of maintain uh, a certain tax bracket or tax efficiently while you're living in there. Tax diversification. Yep, absolutely. You've heard us say that before. That's really important to make sure you're diversified from a tax perspective. Yep. Except that, you know, over the years, there's going to be umpteen different Congresses and presidents and rule changes and things like that. So we don't know, right? It's all going to change over time. So being diversified yeah. really does help you so we can plan as we go. Absolutely. And then, of course, this has to be not just for your income concerns, but mm -hmm. also for what you're planning on passing on. Yeah. Right? Who is this money for? Yeah. Right, ultimately. And yeah. then how do we, mm -hmm. in the most tax efficient way, pass this money on to our kids yeah. so yeah. they don't get hit with a bunch of taxes as well? Mm -hmm. So we help a lot yeah. with that as well, you know, kind yeah. of trying to plan that and and your individual circumstances should govern, as always. We've said that many, many times here. So you might say, well, Jeremy, I don't have kids. You know, we actually both that do. Factors we have, in. have kids. <laughs> but you know, we don't have kids. So, you know, we don't have anybody beyond ourselves to leave it yeah. to. Well, if you're going to leave it to charity, there are some smart ways we can do that too, right? A lot of good strategies, um, which you know, some people say, well, I don't care. I'll be dead. But yeah, but at the end of the day, do you want the government to get the money or do you want your charity to get right. the money? Um, so that there are ways that we can do this that are, are just smart, right? And mindful based off of all these uh, rules. Again, we talked about RMDs. Uh, we won't drill into that anymore. Uh, other potential sources of income, your home. Want to be careful with that one, right? <laughs> we um, both kind of create yeah, that a little bit. Usually we, we want to have that thing. Ideally, we want to have that thing paid off about that by the time you retire, yeah. if not early on in retirement, just from a flexibility standpoint, uh, you could do a reverse mortgage. You know, that's something you could do. Uh, you could use a home equity line of credit. Um, we like to kind of use this as an asset of last resort. It's, yeah. it's not something we, we want to basically plan on you tapping into. There are proper ways that you can use things like this, so cash value, life insurance mm -hmm. policies, yeah. reverse mortgages. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think either of us considers these option one mm -hmm. options. No. 
you know, yeah. but there are smart ways to go about it. If, if you end up being in that position, yes, there are ways to go about it in the proper way, but that's where you absolutely need to be talking to a qualified professional. Yeah. Yeah. Very important. So yeah, as you can tell, we have an opinion on that. <laughs> so let's recap as we round out our time here, we want to make sure we leave plenty of time for questions. Uh, when do you plan to retire? Very important. How long a period should you plan for? Again, a pretty good chunk of time, unless you've got health issues, probably a, a long time. One thing to keep in mind too, is it might not just be for you. You might say, well, I'm not going to live till I'm 95. If, are you married? Uh, if you are, you need to be planning for your spouse too. Uh, so that's important. How much annual income will you need? A lot of planning that needs to go into that. You probably don't know that answer off the top of your head. That's yeah. okay. Uh, we can help with that. How much annual income can you expect from other stuff like social security, pensions, things like that. And on the right-hand side here, you can see a big, big portion of what most of our clients, at least, if if you've built up wealth and whether you feel like you're wealthy or not, right? You probably have some yeah. wealth, you've got investments, things like that. That's what you've got. Those are the resources that you have, and we want to make the most of that. So all these things come into play um, that we've dug into. As we accumulate some Q&A here at the end, um, and Jeremy is going to start looking at our Q&A and mm -hmm. see what questions we've got. So as you have questions, go ahead and put those in the queue. Use the tool here that we've got on Zoom to do that. Uh, a couple of things that we want to go over first, uh, one of those is that our job, believe it or not, our job is to make the complex simple. And you might not feel like that now. You might say, wow, you just made me really confused. And there's so much information. There is. And as you look at all the boxes on this sheet, the reason why we designed this is because sometimes it's hard to explain what a certified financial planner does or yeah. what we at Keystone Financial Services, what we actually do. On, I'd say on average, when people go to somebody who calls themselves a financial advisor, financial planner, they're probably getting that far left-hand column, which is investment planning. And it's not to minimize that. That's an important part of, of what we do, an important part about producing income once you're in retirement. But as we've talked about, we've probably touched on about every box on here. I think at some point during the presentation, we talked about taxes, estate planning, some mistakes that you could be making in some of these other areas. Sometimes those could really dwarf investment mistakes or uh, mistakes around did you pick fund A or fund B. So everything is individualized, but know that it's not just about the investments. There's a lot of gotchas out there and there are a lot of things that are important to understand the rules on. So it, again, you're just optimizing. You're trying to make the most of what you've got and what the rules are. Absolutely. Yep. And really just the, you know, there, like we said, there's so many different factors involved, right? Mm -hmm. Social Security, yeah. Medicare, yeah. Um, how long I'm still working, the timing of all of those and how they come together, right? So it's it's taking all of those things into account for your personal plan and what makes the most sense for you. Yep, absolutely. So lots more to come. Again, we could do a whole seminar on any of these boxes. So as you we can imagine, will. what we've really accomplished here is we've done this 30,000 foot view flyover, right? Of, okay, I, here are things that I may need to be aware of. Now, our, the plug for our services, of course, for some people, they think this is great. Uh, they want to do it themselves and go out and do research and become a financial expert. That's probably not people who would work with us, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so if, if you're saying, you know what, I need a plan. I need somebody who can be a fiduciary, which is what we are, can be a fiduciary, sit on the same side of the table as as uh, myself and my family trying to help us do what we need to do here um, and have an opinion, right? We, we have an opinion mm -hmm. to be able to serve you and take care of your stuff. So that's really what we do. And we'd be happy to visit with any of you. Initial conversations are always free, uh, just bouncing ideas off of us and helping um, us understand more about how we might be able to help you uh, really could set you on a much better path. Um, even if you don't end up working with us, you may end up doing this yourself or, or uh, going a different direction. But a lot of our clients have been with us for many, many years, and we've really just enjoyed those relationships, uh, not only uh, the business side of things, but the personal side as well. So that comes to our team. We've got a team of, of great people. And uh, of course, we're here to serve you and your family and uh, anybody that you care about. Uh, that's almost exclusively how we grow is based off of referrals. Uh, just introductions that our clients are making to their friends, their coworkers, family members, things like that. And it's been a good year. We've actually had a very good year Absolutely. from a growth standpoint. And to thank you to all of you who have sent your friends, family, coworkers, that you've sent people our way, because that's exactly how we've done so well this year. And our job really is to help um, you do well and help your friends do well. It's about kind of growing together and being on the same side of the table. So with that being said, that was a mouthful, but uh, with that being said, here's our contact information. 
And uh, do we have any questions in the queue right now? You know what? Jeremy? We do not have any questions. Oh, so well, we're, we're, coming, up on our, we're coming up on our hour here, right? We must have done such a good time on this. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, a couple more minutes yet. If you do have any questions, please ask. Otherwise, uh, if it's something that you'd rather have kind of a more personal discussion on, mm -hmm. we're really great about that. You can uh, We have our contact information up there. Yeah. You can always feel free to visit us at keystonefinancial.com uh, as well. Uh, and all of our contact information is there as well. Yeah, the email is a great way, by the way, if you just want to kind of trigger a conversation that, hey, you know, I've got a question, just shoot us an email and we can typically uh, jump on the phone. Or one of us or one of our team members can jump on the phone with you uh, to schedule an introductory call. Um, it could be kind of short, covering some areas that might be pertinent to you right now. And then we might schedule another meeting after that, which would get into far more detail, right? We're starting to collect a lot more information, things like that. So as you can see, we've got two main locations. We've got Colorado and Arizona are our two main areas that our clients live right now. But literally, we have clients live all over the country. Sometimes it's because they moved other places to work or to retire, mm -hmm. things like that. Uh, but in a lot of cases, especially these days, we end up working with people. Um, to, we work on Zoom, right? We work over the phone. So geographically, we're not restricted uh, right now. But our two main locations are Colorado and Arizona, if you want to sit down with us face to face. So Absolutely. that being said, again, no questions. That means that we are really good at what we, we are do, really right? good, we are... very clear and concise. <laughs> yeah. So lots more to come. I appreciate you all being here, uh, by the way. We know that your time is valuable. So thanks for giving up uh, your hour. And again, a recording of this will be available. If you've been sitting here saying, yeah, my, my spouse should have been on here. Or my coworker should have been on here. They need to know this. Uh, we're definitely going to have a recorded version that's very shareable off of our YouTube channel. So again, just go to keystonefinancial.com, go to our social media in the YouTube, whatever that looks like. I can't remember uh, the YouTube icon, yeah. right? You go out to our channel and that should be available later today. Uh, that being said, just thanks so much. We love the relationship that we get to have with you um, and your families. Anything that you need, let us know. We're here as a resource. Otherwise, have a wonderful week. Thank you for your time. Take care. Yep. Thank you.